I do have it. Okay. So. Let me go through this lecture quickly with the, uh, let's see, slide from the beginning, maybe. Okay. So some of you probably have reviewed this lecture video already, but let me just quickly go over this. All right. So sometime when you are doing tests for mean and using a t-test, and you realize a normality test is, uh, is a normality assumption is not good, well, after you've done normality tests, right? So. So here is an example. If you want to test average contaminant level based on a sample of 10, all right, to see you want to see whether average contaminant level is is different from 50 or not, right, based on this data. So usually, if if the data is normally distributed, all right, or data support normality assumption, then what test will you use for testing average contaminant level that exceeds uh, different from 50? You will do a one sample t-test, right? Testing whether average is different from 50 or not. But if this data actually looked great, right? So normality passed. But what if you have a strange data out here? Maybe you have, a, instead of 49, you have a piece of data that is 9, right? Then the data is not normal, okay? So if that's the case, you will try non-parametric alternative for it, okay? So uh, there is a so-called, there are actually two tests that some of the textbooks suggest. One is sign test, one is sign rank test. Right? Sign test really just assigns sign to all the data. So if you have decided that, that you want to compare with 50, so you want to look at how many pieces of data is above 50, how many pieces of data are below 50, okay? And just count how many data are above, all right? If the median or mean is 50, then if that's true, then you're going to expect, if you have 10 pieces of data, you expect five pieces above it, five pieces below it. Right, if 50 really is the mean, and the distribution is symmetrical, so you can use a binomial test. Actually, use a binomial probability to calculate the p-value. Right? However, that test is not really as good as so-called the Wilcoxon sine rank test, which it doesn't only use just sine; it also assigns rank to these data values. So you have more information there, and that's called sine rank test. But you realize that you will realize until you learn several non-parametric tests, you'll find out that. A lot of these non-parametric tests, you assign rank to the data. So instead of using the original data value, you use a rank, right? You rank all these data from smallest to largest uh, data value from 1, right, 2, and 3, and 4. The, the reason, uh, b because if you use these rank, you don't have extreme value anymore, right? So you ha don't have extremely large or extremely small value anymore. So most of the, the non-parametric tests is taking that approach, ranking the data. But when you're ranking these data, you lose some information. So that's a, it's kind of a disadvantage of non-parametric tests. However, these non-parametric tests are good for any kind of distribution. Your data is not normal, that's fine. Your data is uniform, your data is Poisson, your data is any kind, it's fine. Non-parametric tests will work, right? That's the advantage of that. But you do realize that it suffers a loss of some information, right? It has less restricted as distribution assumption but it lost some information. Okay, so uh, that's actually the drawback. And in the old day, also it's hard to run non-parametric tests because it requires a huge computing time to figure out the sampling distribution of statistics. Okay, so uh, in the old day, not many people actually were able to run non-parametric tests for some strange situation, and you always have to rely on big table, not just small table, you know, to get some detail, p-value. So it's pretty hard. Most of the people will use a critical value approach to do the problem because p-value is very hard to get unless you get the whole sampling distribution, and it's hard to get, right? So in the old day, non-parametric tests is not so easy to do, but now computing power is so great that we can use non-parametric tests even to find out the exact distribution, exact sampling distribution. Right? But anyway, uh, for Wilcoxon sign rank test. Right? This is uh, the one that I recommend. Between sign test and sign rank test, I recommend you actually use a sign rank test. Right? Sign test, sometimes people also call it binomial test, right? using a binomial distribution. So this Wilcoxon sign rank test is actually a non-parametric alternative for one sample t-test. And it can be used for one sample or using a pair sample. And when you're doing this data analysis, I mean hypothesis testing, first step, you have to prepare your data. Right? so that your data fit well for one sample or pair sample. 
So what you do need to do, first thing you have to calculate is so-called the DIs, all right, the difference, like what we did earlier in pair sample t-test. So if you want to apply to one sample t-test, DI will be your sample value minus the mean under the null hypothesis. <coughs> okay. So that's prepare your DI. And if you do pair sample tests, then that's easy. Just the, the pair differences right, will be your DIs. Okay. And you can use a test for doing two-sided tests or one-tail tests, depends on your needs. Okay. So this is similar to the one sample T test. Okay. And the assumption is only that this difference from some continuous distribution, but oftentimes people also apply to discrete distribution, and it still works very well. Right? So that's the only assumption. It doesn't have to be normal. Then what you do is you actually, you have, once you find the difference, okay, some of the differences are positive, some of the differences are negative, right? Before we actually ca calculate the test statistic, we take the absolute value of those differences and rank those values, okay? Once you have those value ranks, then the test statistic actually is sum of those ranks who are associated with the positive difference. Okay, we call it S plus. Then if you take critical, uh, critical value approach, these are the rejection region right, for critical values based on different level of significance. Okay, and of course there's P value approach. What you do is you find the tail area based on these test statistics in the sampling distribution of this test statistic under null hypothesis. The same idea as, it, as any test, right? You, once you have the sampling statistic, I mean test statistic, you want to use a distribution behavior to test statistic under null hypothesis to see whether your evidence is significant or extreme under that null hypothesis. Okay, so that it has a sampling distribution of this S plus, right? Like I said, uh, <clears throat> when sample size is small, it's easy to calculate the sampling distribution, and this sample distribution actually is, is actually discrete, not continuous. And when sample size is large, actually we can come up with an approximation of this distribution. Often time is like a, either standard normal, I mean Z, standard normal distribution or, or chi-square distribution. Right. Uh, let's, let me do this. Okay. Uh, but if you take p-value approach, p-value will be area to the right of test statistic if you're doing right-sided test, area to the left of test statistic if you're doing left-sided test. Uh, this is the same idea. Okay, as we learned earlier. Uh, so here is an example. We have those 10 pieces of data. We first rank them. Okay, this is applying to that one sided test. We rank them. Okay, now you realize some are negative, some are positive, right? So we rank them according to their actual, actual difference, right? So this is absolute value, right? of one, the smallest, the rank for that is one. The second smallest is two, the rank of that is two. And third smallest is this number, right? Regardless of the sign, okay? Then you realize these are all the parts of sign, right? And the ranks, the test statistic will be actually sum of these rank of the, the, the uh, that has positive sign associated with it. That's a test statistic, okay? Then you, you will use a sampling distribution of this test statistic under null hypothesis uh, to calculate the p-value, right? So the way to get, a calculate, uh, to, get, to get the test statistic is this, a right? sum of the rank that associated with positive sign, okay? So I use a software, actually, R command to calculate the area to the right of this, uh, that's 0 0.004883 from software, okay? Now you can actually find the uh, critical value from the table. So a lot of textbook has table that give you the uh, a critical value associated with different levels of significance. Right? That, that, if you use a, a web assign book, it has those critical values too. But those critical values are usually not exact, right? not exactly 5% because the, the exact sam the sampling distribution, such as statistic, actually is discrete, not continuous. Right? How do they generate a sampling distribution of statistic? Well, if null hypothesis is true, actually, this, this is one set of rank configuration based on the data, right? And there, you have all kinds of possible data that can be, right, in the, in, when you collect them with a sample of size 10. If the null hypothesis is true, 
any rain configuration should have the same chance to occur. So the sampling distribution is calculated based on the rank sum of positive rank using all the different possible rank configuration, right? Each rank configuration with a psi has an S plus, right? So there's so many possible ways to do that, right? Each one has a statistic value. So you use that to form a, a, sam a sampling distribution, and it's a top thing to do. Just look at the possible arrangement of these rank configuration of 10 pieces of data. That's 10 factorial that many ways. Each one you have to figure out its test statistic, and based on different, also the sign arrangement, right? So that's a very tedious computation. If you use a calculator to figure out what's 10 to the uh, 10 factorial is, right? You know what factorial is, right? So that's a very tough thing to do. And, but that's still discrete, right? You have finite number of outcome. It's not like Z standard normal or T distribution. So it's a kind of discrete distribution. So it's really hard to find a critical value that match exactly at 5%. That's also is a drawback for the using a discrete distribution. So some people actually prefer to use a large sample approximation instead of discrete using the exact distribution. Right? But anyway, so that's, this is how we do the sign rank test, how we get the sign rank uh, test statistic, right? sum of the positive rank. Right? Here is just a table, one example of a table for Wilcoxon sign rank test. Right? What they do to figure out critical value is figure out a number that is closest to that 0.05. If you want to use 0.05 as a cutoff, right? Use that 44 as a critical value. I mean, if you have a test statistic that is below 40, above 44 in this case, that means your evidence is extreme, right? So you're going to reject down hypothesis. That's if you take table approach. I use a table to help you to draw the conclusion. Okay. Right. And R is like 52, was it? So actually we have a p-value about 0.005. Okay, and with the, with the uh, R commander, it'll just give you the p-value right there, right, and statistic 52. So that's pretty easy to do, okay. Uh, so that's a sign rank test uh, actually applied to one sample situation, right. So this is kind of a quick review. You can state your hypothesis, and the test statistic is po sum of positive rank, right, if you realize how we do the ranking, right. First, we have to find a difference, right? If you do a pair sample test, actually, you will first figure out your pair differences, and the rest of them will be the same, okay? So uh, this is that uh, data we just looked at earlier today, okay? We have these pair differences, some are positive, some are negative. We just figure out the sign, but then we assign rank for these data by ignoring their sign, right? Then we then add the rank for part, the, those rank that associate with positive sign, and that will be your test statistic. Now, there's a situation that probably when you try to figure out these difference, you get a value zero. Whenever you get a zero, now the suggestion is you skip that one. So you don't rank anything that is zero, no difference. Okay. There is when there is a tie. Before and after, it's exactly the same. You drop that. Okay. So the rank sum. Uh, sum of positive ring is 58 in this situation, then rest of it will be similar, right? Either if you want to use a table to figure out critical value or use a software right, to help you to figure out the tail area for 58 in order to, for you to actually calculate the p-value, right? This is based on the uh, sign rank test table. Uh, 55, actually, do we get 55? We get 58. If you have 55, you already have a p-value of 0.027, all right, 58, even further away from it, so p-value should be even smaller, all right. So you know that 58 is between 55 to 59, its p-value should be between these two numbers. It depends on what kind of score is provided in the table. They will provide you some score with the tail area, and you can use that to help you to roughly estimate the p-value. But if you use the R commander, uh, you get the exact p-value there for you, okay. So I hope this makes sense right, to you. Test statistic is important, right? I think there's probably a Professor, question like that. I, yes? I think, I think there's a, when we put the V as a, a 50, it gives us the p-value of 0 0.004883. When we put 52, mm -hmm. it gives us a different re, um, output in our commander for some reason than the slides. 52? Uh, 
So when I put in the in the statistics, mm -hmm. um, when I go to the options and I put um, the the um, the actual null hypothesis mu is fifty. Mm -hmm. It gives me your results. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of I course. Have 52, it gives me no, no, no. Results. So these, these are these are actually rank sum statistic. This is not the hypothesized value, right? These are the psi rank statistic. No, I, I understand mm. that. Yeah. But if I go to the previous slide mm -hmm. that you showed us, the output is different for some reason than, than the results. So if you go to slide, what is it, NP, uh, um, NP10? Okay. And when, when, when we're on the test, on, on the data that you provided on the slide, the P value is a little bit different, I got. So when I put the V as, as, as 50, I get that result. Okay. I put 52, a different result. Okay, okay, okay. No, no, no. This V50 is actually really just the S plus in our lecture, in our test. Okay. This is not the test value. See what I'm saying? When you do this test, the no, mu? no, 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 no. This is not not the mu. Okay, the the mu is this 50. We're testing whether it's different from 50 or greater than 50. Oh, I see. Okay, I see. yeah. Thank you. Then. That v v here is actually the s plus. All right. Now, everybody use different notation. All right. S plus is pretty standard, but when this person who wrote the R package, that he actually used a v as a s plus sign, positive sign rank. Okay. Okay, good Thank question, you. good question, yeah. The test we're, t the, the hypothesis we're testing is we really mean 50 or not, okay? And in fact, most of, the, most of these non-parametric tests for a uh, non-parametric alternative for testing mean or comparing mean, they, are act they actually mean uh, testing the distribution, a median of the distribution is equal to 50 or not, okay? Now, if the data is, you, you believe the data is symmetrically distributed, then the mean and median will be the same. So you can use this for testing for mean value. Now, if the distribution of the data is not symmetrical, then you can only conclude that the median, right, for the test, the median is greater than 50 or median is uh, different from 50, right? So this is something I have to let you know first, right? It's not testing mean. The design of the test itself is not, it's actually for testing median of the distribution, okay? So when you conclude your analysis, you want to say it's greater than median. Although you use a non-parametric test, right? Originally, you probably want to test for mean, but since you're doing non-parametric, it'd be better you comment it as a, you know, the median is different from 50 or, unless it just, you know that distribution is symmetrical. Okay. Good question. Thanks. Thanks for asking. All right. So that's, you see an example of, you know, sine rank tests apply to one sample, and also it's an example of sine rank tests apply to pair sample. Okay, so that's, that's great. Right. Let me see. Let's do it slightly different. Right? Let me, let's just try to do a non-parametric test for that data that we have there. Oh, actually, we did it, right? Uh, let me go to the R commander. The output, all right? So this is a different application. I was, we use this data there, okay? And then uh, this data that we use today, and we get this result. Uh, where is it? This result, the p-value is 0.0, okay? And this is actually testing whether it's greater than zero or not. Uh, so that's good. We did that, all right? That's great, all right? So... You see how to run, right? Then there are options. So let me run that again. Non-parametric test, <coughs> uh, pair sample test, Wilcoxon test, right? And then choose that pair. Okay, you have options to choose whether you want to do one-sided or two-sided test, right? And then click OK. So that's how you do a uh, Wilcoxon pair sample test, okay? Now, if you want to do one sample test, all right, let's go back to... Did I do one sample? Was that for one sample? Let me see. This is here sample. If I want to do one sample test, okay. Let me uh, create a data. Let me close this one. Uh, uh, let me say close. Okay. Let me just quickly create a data. All right. Uh, I'm just randomly pick some number. So I'm testing 
the mean of the sample population, let's say, is different from phi. Okay, if I want to do that, and I want to use a sine rank test, okay, but to set up a sine rank test, you have to choose a pair, right? So in that case, you're going to add a column, make that phi as a second observation, all right? So this will be like your now, and this is, will be like your measurement. Okay, so you want to test whether the mean of this is significantly different from the null hypothesis five or not. Okay, you can set up your data like a paired situation, right? Your null hypothesis in one column, and you click OK. Then if I click statistic, non-parametric test, pair sample test, and uh, measure and null. Click alternative. If you want to just test whether they're different or not, and this will be okay. Click OK. You get the p-value for that test, sign rank test. Okay. If you want to use a pair sample setting. Uh, if we want to do, so, so that's for pair tests or, or independent sample, t, one sample t test, right? No, alternative for one sample t test. If you wish to, if you have a situation that you actually have two sample, right? So this is one sample. Oh, it's down. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed one. I right? do have large sample. I mentioned, I think, I do have large sample. There's a large sample z test. Sample, sample size large, you can use a standard normal to approximate it, right? That's test statistic, okay? If you have two independent sample, then there is actually non-parametric test for two independent sample. It's called, it's also developed by Wilcoxon, right? It's called Wilcoxon rank sum test. So when you do Wilcoxon rank sum test, right, it is for, it's a non-parametric alternative for two independent sample tests. And so you will have two sample. And this also depends on the author. Different textbook author or write it in a different way, okay? Uh, in Pagano's book, actually what they do is, uh, I believe when you have two sample, they will make the first sample the smaller sample. Whichever sample size is smaller, you put it as the first sample, okay? So we call this first sample and this is the second sample, okay? And there is a notation M, this denotes sample size. That's a sample size for the first sample. And this Wilcoxon rank sum test, right, is actually based on the rank sum of the first sample. What they do is, if you have these two samples, you actually order, I mean, I'm sorry, rank these data, overall data, right? So among these nine pieces of data, 0.5 is the smallest, 0.8 is the next smallest, 0.9 is the third smallest, and so forth. You rank all these data value, and the test statistic is rank sum for the first sample. Okay. So you have to do some preparation, okay? Now, if you are trying to test whether there is a, the, the difference is significant from certain value or not, then it, you need to make that difference uh, uh, by, include that difference by using the observation you have on the first sample, subtract that difference. So there is that preparation step there, right? If your goal is just to see whether there is significant difference between the two or not, then this difference that you want to include is zero, right? So there is some preparation there. Rank the data, right? If there is a difference you want to test, put it in the first sample, and then rank the data, and the test statistic is rank sum for the first sample, okay? And so uh, if the two sample sizes are the same, for instance, then this rank sum will help you to understand whether there is any difference or not, right? If the rank sum is extremely small, or rank sum extremely large, that is suggesting that, that there's significant difference between these two samples, okay? And under the null hypothesis, that rank sum also have a sampling distribution. And again, it depends on sample size. Different sample size, you're gonna have different sampling distribution. That makes the non-parametric test a little bit hard, right, in generating a table right, for helping us to figure out critical value and so forth. But life is great nowadays because we have the computer, right, so it can do that so quickly for us. So just like a regular two independent sample t-test, right, you have the same kind of null and alternative hypothesis. Okay? And again, this will be the first step you do when you try to test hypothesis. 
And then second step is compute the test statistic and remember your test statistic. Oftentimes people use a W to denote that. It's sum of rings for the XI. XI is the measurement in the first sample, the sample that have smaller sample size, minus is different that we should detect. Okay. So once we find that rank sum, then there are table for you to figure out critical value if you want to find, find critical value, uh, do critical value approach. Or you can calculate the p-value based on this rank sum, right, uh, using the software or use a table. Okay. So this is a situation that we actually have that particular data, rank sum is, is 14, and we have a sample size of 4 and 5. Okay. So this tells us that if you have a rank sum that is... Uh, uh, 27, the p-value is about 0.56, right? Higher than that, p-value gets smaller. That's on the larger end, right? There's also a smaller end, too, okay? So um, for 28, if this is actually the average, right, uh, you're going to reject. If you take critical value page, look at this decision rule, right? Once you figure out the critical value, depends on you're doing right side, left side, or two-sided test, you can calculate the, uh, uh, actually figure out the critical value, okay, and figure out decision rule. Using the critical value in some table and figure out decision rule. So this, this slide here just helping you to figure out the critical value. Uh, when, you, when we're doing two-sided test, right, it's either greater than 28 a greater than n times n plus n plus 1 minus that 28 will give you another n if you're doing two-sided tests, right? It's a little bit awkward, right? It's strange. But uh, if you have a software, software will actually give you nice-looking results, right? But it doesn't give you, actually, we have 14, right? If you use R, R doesn't give you 14. Actually, R gives you 4. That means the way that R defines this test statistic is slightly different from the, the, the textbook. And like I told you, different people actually write, for, define the statistics slightly different, but the end result will be the same. You will have the exact the same p-value because different authors are using different statistics, so they use a different sampling distribution based on the same principle. Right? So what's the difference between the output from R and output from a textbook, a result from textbook? I checked the R uh, help page and realized that this W statistic in R is the test statistics W that we get in the, from your web assigned textbook, right? Subtract the sample size for the smaller sample plus sample size from the smaller sample plus 1 divided by 2, right? That's average rank for the small sample, right? Uh, I shouldn't say the smallest popular average rank for the small sample. So anyway, just remember this formula. If you have a statistic from our textbook, right, that statistic minus this quantity will be equivalent to the, uh, the rank sum from R. Now, if you hate to do this rank sum calculation yourself, you want to use R to solve it, then whenever R gives you a number, you should reverse this process to get the statistic in web assign so they can answer web assign question. Right. What I'm trying to say is if you have a statistic from web assign, you use that web assign minus this number, you get a statistic that provide to you from R, right? You reverse the process. That means if you have a W statistic from R, okay, you add this quantity, it will give you the statistic that you need if you try to do a problem from web assign. Hope that makes sense? Okay. So if you try to use R to solve a problem, instead of trying to figure it out yourself by hand, right, do the ranking to get the rank sum, right, then take that R statistic, add this quantity, you get back to the statistic. You should have had that from web assign the textbook, uh, doing the approach, taking the approach from web assign textbook, okay? So hopefully this, this will help you in also answering your web assign problem. And of course, there's also a large sample approach. If you have statistic calculated, you can actually use this formula uh, to do a Z test. So it'll be a large sample test. Okay, so the Z test is like regular Z test, or the Z test you saw earlier in our in our lecture for testing for proportion, right? Decision criteria will be the same. Right side of the test, p-value area to the right of the statistic. 
left side test area to the left of Z statistic, two side test area to the tail of that Z statistic time two, right? So it would be same principle, right? Uh, the next slide is the Kruskal Wallace test, right? So that's actually how do we do Kruskal Wallace test? Although I've shown you the, how to use the R command to do Kruskal Wallace test, but the, the way it is done is again similar to what Cox and Ring sum test, uh, two independent sample tests. You do the overall ranking. I have these 12, 24 pieces of data, rank from smallest number, smallest rank one, second smallest two, and so forth. Whenever there is a tie, like 11 pieces and 10 and 11 pieces are the same, I use a midpoint, 10.5. All right, that's how we do the ranking. Whenever there is a tie, you use a mid rank. So let's say number, rank number three and four and five are the same value, then you should use four for ranking all these three values. Right? Use a mid rank. Then uh, this is a formula for calculating the Kruskal Wallace test statistic. Right? Ri is the rank sum for the i, the rank of the i sample. Okay, and this is actually this is called shortcut formula. You can do it this way. This is defining formula. What this is doing is actually finding the variability between ranks I mean, from different sample. Right? So you use average rank and find the difference of average rank from each group with the overall rank and accumulate average rank from each group to overall rank. Right? This can help us measure the variability between, rank, between groups. Right? So the same idea as a one-way ANOVA app test, except for now we're actually applying rank, overall rank to all the data and plug into this formula, you get that crucial all the test statistic. And this could be a large sample too, right? If you have, dark, there's a large sample test for this too. When sample size get large, the statistic follow actually a chi-squared distribution, right? There's a different distribution. And that actually it's chi-squared with degrees of freedom, C minus one, C being the number of groups that we have, number of samples that we have. But if you have a software, actually software take care of it, just like the example I just shown you. Okay. Um, any question? Do you have any question? Did I show you a Wilcoxon ring sum test? I think I did not, right? Uh, for two independent sample tests. Let's go to the second data. Second data, I actually have three sample, right? Let me do this. Let me. See if I can delete current row. Just delete these rows, right? So I make it a two sample problem. So at these two independent random sample, I want to test whether there's a significant difference between the uh, BMI from these two groups. Okay? So I'm going to click OK out of this. I can click statistic. Non-parametric test, uh, two sample. Well, it's not working. Doesn't, uh, I actually messed up with that group, right? So I have to do it again. Convert group variable using number. Okay, then I can do it again. Statistic, non-parametric, and then two sample with Coxon test. Okay, click on that. Group variable there, BMI, just like two independent sample tests. Option, you can choose two-sided, one-sided test. Okay, and then just click OK to do two-sided test. You get the p-value right there, right? 0 0.06795. <coughs> so actually, this tells you that the difference is not statistically significant. Right? It's similar to our, the result from our two-sample two test, two-sample t-test, okay, with slightly larger p-value. Okay. Now, somebody would say, since non-parametric test is good, it's, it's good for any distribution, why not I just use non-parametric test and I just forget about, forget about parametric test that we always have to check the assumption? Well, the, 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 the truth is this, right? If the data is really normally distributed, your t-test will have better power in detecting a difference because the data satisfies the assumption behind that test procedure. Okay, so there are places that actually t-tests outperform non-parametric tests. So if you try to use non-parametric tests for everything, in some situation there is probably a significant difference, but you won't be able to detect it, right? So make sure that you actually, if there is a possibility that, that if the t-test is good, you want to use a t-test. 
Anytime you're doing a research, uh, you like to see that difference, right? Whether significant or not. If instead of using a non-parametric test, you ignore the distribution pattern for the population, right? You may not get the desired results you want, right? So make sure if the normality test is good, and normality assumption is good, do the parametric test. When the normality assumptions are not good, then you do the non-parametric test. In fact, there are studies saying that the non-parametric test actually outperform t-test when the underlying distribution is not normal. It has better power in detecting difference, right? If the underlying distribution is not normal, it will outperform t-test. Okay. So don't just every time, just every time do non-parametric test because you think that assumption is better, right? Is always satisfied. That's not really what you want to do. Okay, uh, just uh, it's important to know that. Okay, I'm sorry. I think it seems like I'm taking I'm taking too much time. A little bit over. Uh, any question? Do you have any question? Okay. If not.